CompC.com is your home for buying, selling, and flipping all of the hottest trading cards. Their consignment marketplace is home to over 23 million cards across all major eras and genres. With a CompC.com account, you can purchase cards from different sellers over time and ship them home together later or immediately reprice them for sale on the CompC marketplace to try and flip. To continue serving collectors as our hobby grows, ComC is actively hiring for a range of different roles. Learn more and apply online at comc.com slash jobs. You're listening to the Wax Pack Hero Sports Card Minute, a podcast where we discuss both the hobby and business sides of collecting. I'm your host, Mike Summer, and I want to help you buy, sell, and trade your way into a collection you'll love. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Wax Pack Hero Sports Card Minute. Today, I have an interview for you with someone who has spent their entire career working for one of the iconic sports card companies, and that is Chris Carlin from Upper Deck. Chris has played a variety of roles, as you'll hear in the interview, at Upper Deck, Everything from just kind of filling basic orders to customer service to marketing. And now he kind of has his hands in almost all of those things. And that is good to hear because Upper Deck's reputation for customer service is one of the top in the industry. And Chris is a big part of that. And we'll hear a little bit about why that is in the interview. So I hope you enjoy that. First, I want to shout out Underdog Collectibles. They're an online shop run by collectors for collectors. They break new product every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday night. You can check out udogcollect.com to see what they're going to be breaking this week. Then you can watch live on your YouTube channel. It's probably the best place to check out their live breaks. And you can subscribe or join their Facebook community as well. It's a, a great community of people who are willing to answer questions, share their hits, talk sports, all that kind of stuff. And so check them out at udogcollect.com and tell them Wax Pack Hero sent you. Hi, this is Greg from the Rebel Base Card Podcast, and you are listening to Mike Summer on the Wax Pack Hero Sports Card Minute. Chris, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm glad we get a, a chance to finally connect and, and talk a little bit about you and a little bit about Upper Deck. Sure. How about for those who may not be as familiar with you, we start by just getting a little bit of your background in the hobby. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, I grew up collecting. Um, I had three older brothers, so they were, uh, they were always, uh, collecting baseball cards and, um, uh, and it was the, the eighties and late seventies, eighties that they collected. And, uh, I really got into it, um, uh, early mid eighties and, um, through the, the junk wax era is <laughs> when I was really collecting, but I was uh, I was thrilled when they went off to uh, high school and college because they uh, they found out about girls and uh, left their cards behind and uh, they were done with them and uh, I picked them up and was just having a blast in the hobby and and uh, get my feet wet and the first Becketts were coming out so there was a lot to dive into back then and now it's 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 uh, it's a bit daunting how how much is out there but I went to to college and then I graduated and. Had a buddy asked me if I wanted to uh, come down. He had a, a beach house down here in Carlsbad. And so I came down, was looking for work over the summer. And I saw Upper Deck was was here in Carlsbad. I was like, holy crap, that's incredible. I I just went in like in a suit and, and, and was like, how do I work here? Tell me what to do. <laughs> you know, totally geeking out. I had a variety of, of, of small jobs starting off with Upper Deck just as a temporary associate. A lot of it was uh, the leagues need uh, needed sets, you know, so for each release, you'd put a set together and send it to different leagues or, or what have you. So doing a lot of collation of sets as a, as a, as my first job, but I was, I was thrilled. I was like, this is great. And then uh, I moved on to, I had, I had some sales experience in, in uh, college. So I moved on to uh, work in customer service, then work in sales, then manage the customer service group. And, uh, then go uh, and work in marketing for a while. I was a proponent of us getting on social media, being one of the first companies on social media and uh, engaging with fans there. And and now I've kind of gone full circle. I, I work very closely with our marketing group. I manage our customer care group. I uh, handle our social media um, and do a lot with uh, with PR and advertising. So 
uh, wear a lot of hats, but uh, it's a lot of fun and it's been a, a great ride. Yeah. Lifelong career with Upper Deck. And that is is pretty fantastic and, and not something that you hear a lot about these days of, of somebody still having their entire career with the same organization. You talked a little bit about customer service and engaging with with customers and fans on social media. And I would say that is one of the things that Upper Deck is known for, is their level of customer service and their level of engagement with fans. What is it about your approach that makes you so recognized in the industry when it comes to customer service and engagement? Uh, well, usually it's it's being out at a show and being able to, to engage with our fans there and and just having a lot of fun. I mean, this this industry is fun. And, and I get thrilled when I see, you know, collectors put together a set or have that big pull and their shaky hands. So I guess I've, I've just been very present at a lot of events. And, you know, I, I do a lot of videos or Instagram lives or things like that. During When the pandemic hit, I was like, wow, I've got to up my video editing game. And, you know, so I started uh, uh, dabbling more in that and, and putting a, more, a few more things out there. But I, I think just, you know, that I've been around for a while, I've been recognizable. Um, I think one thing that I love to do is anytime I'm traveling someplace on behalf of the company, uh, I like to find a hobby shop or two in that area and, and stop in. I know our president, Jason Mashara, does the same. And it's once you walk through a shop owner's door, um, it, it means a lot to them. And it, it helps us get better as well, where we are taking all the input we get from that shop owner, all the customers that happen to be in there. And we put it back into our business and, and try to make better products and better service. But really, I just I feel like ever since growing up, Upper Deck was like the, the Cadillac of sports cards. And and I believe that the premium products deserve a premium service. And I really try to instill that into our reps and, uh, and they're passionate about uh, helping our customers. Uh, only issue now is there's a lot more customers. You know, <laughs> there's there's a lot more interest in our category than there has ever been before. And uh, I had one of our reps uh, move on to a new opportunity with our North Carolina group. And it is hard to enter. I, I was able to get uh, some uh, increases in headcount to add more reps to, to make sure that we're providing great service to all these new fans. But man, it is hard to interview people during a pandemic. It is hard to train people during a pandemic, uh, especially on our business. So we've, we've uh, I guess, stubbed our toe over the last couple of months with regard to response time. But I think by April, May, that fans will see us responding, you know, same, same day, same hour, uh, potentially with regard to response. So we're getting there. You talked about a couple things there that I, I maybe want to go a little bit deeper on. The first one sure. is, you know, you talked about your own approach to customer service and dealing with customers, and then you hit on training other reps, right? And yeah. for for a company to have that reputation, it's got to be something that is instilled in the culture. And so is that something that, that Upper Deck does reach to their associates is is that level of customer service and engagement? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I hit right in our training seminar is I don't want you to be a, a good customer care rep. I want you to provide remarkable, uh, remarkable service. And what I mean by that is that people actually take the time to remark, you know, about how good you were. You know, they write you a letter, they send you an email, they go on Twitter talking about you, they go to the BBB and, and write a review. And, you know, I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that that if I walk outside my office, there are uh, walls full of letters from and emails and tweets from from collectors all around the world, you know, praising Upper Deck for for our service. And, and our our owner walks through these halls, our president walks through these halls, all our staff walk through these halls. So I, I think it is that's how you make it part of the culture is you you just put it everywhere and and. It wasn't easy, you know, when we started to have this thing called a wall of praise. There were only a couple of letters up there initially. It looked like a buried tree. But uh, that, I think, inspired our reps more to to fill it. And uh, once a year, usually I'll, I'll take it down for customer uh, care week and take all the letters down. And I'm like, start again, you know, like, let's go get it again. And and that's that's just a lot of fun. Our group is uh, is very passionate about providing that remarkable level of service to our customers and, and keeping them engaged and happy. I think with, with shops, you know, five, five, 10 years ago, it was harder for us because, 
you know, we'd talk to a shop and they'd say, oh, I've got this, this customer, you've got to take care of them. We didn't really know who that customer was because there was that, that middle person in there. Now Upper Deck does a lot more direct to consumer with our EPAC program. So I can go into that customer's account and say, oh my gosh, this guy is obviously collecting a lot of Toronto Maple Leafs, or he's got a lot of uh, golf cards, you know, I loves, apparently he loves golf. So as we're working on solutions for them, we have a much better feel for who our customer is, what they like. And uh, we use that to our advantage when, you know, if they have a dinged card, you know, we know to go through their history and, and find out who they are and what they like and make sure that we're getting them something they enjoy. And your random acts of kindness are also well, well known within the industry. And I think those types of things also just help go that extra mile and help customers see that, that you guys do care. Yeah. I, I, it reminds me of a, a quote from mother Teresa. Uh, she says, if you can't feed a hundred people, just feed one. And I feel that with regard to our, our random acts of kindness program, that's exactly it. It is daunting to think about letting every customer that we have know how much we appreciate them. Uh, I kind of think of, I do this because I kind of think of the random acts of kindness as like a little hug that we give our, our customers a virtual hug. Um, but really that's what it is. You know, it, it takes a little time out of our day to write a handwritten note and think about that customer before we write it and try to put together something that we think they will enjoy. And, and I always love how excited collectors get for a mail day, whether it be a redemption or something they bought on eBay or a trade, but they get really excited about a mail day they don't expect. And that's what Random Acts of Kindness is about. It's about uh, letting our customers know that, you know, we're the collector's choice for a reason. And also just seeing the, the fun response that we get to those. If, it's definitely worth checking out hashtag UDRAK on Twitter because you'll see the reactions. I've seen people crying over receiving them or uh, handshaking. It's, it's, it's all the, the good feel that, uh, that the, this hobby can provide that uh, uh, that that program delivers. So we've been doing that since our 25th anniversary. Uh, we do some interactive things with Random Act of Kindness at shows. But really, it's just a, a great tool in our tool chest to, to let our customers know how much we appreciate and value them. Let's talk a little bit about this last year. Uh, it seems that COVID's impact on the industry has brought both challenges and opportunities. How has Upper Deck adapted through this time? It's been hard. And, and, and I know that sometimes customers and collectors will say, you, you can't use that COVID excuse anymore. We're almost out of the woods, you know. We have to. Uh, it, it's it's absolutely affecting our vendors. We you know we we can't. We used to be able to do press checks and be on on hand, and and that's not that's not allowed right now. And uh, they've had to rethink their whole workflows. You know, uh, if you look at a line for trading cards, it's it's. I wish we could film this and show it but that's just not allowed with our vendors. But, you know, it, it's tight confines that people are working in. They're packing up boxes. They're putting the boxes into cases. They're sealing them. You know, people are working very, very close together. And that can't happen right now. So we've seen issues with, uh, with some card quality that, that none of us are happy with, with some uh, collation issues. But we've also seen some of our vendors come through with, with flying colors. The big thing that takeaway is that, you know, I'm staffing up. <laughs> not just for all the new collectors that are in the category, but, but if there are issues, if there are issues during this pandemic where, where product isn't as good as we would like it to be, we're going to be there for our fans. So um, I want to make sure I have plenty of agents on staff to, to help and assist with, with anything that comes up. One, one of those ways that cards are still able to get in the hands of customers is through the EPAC partnership with ComC. That's a the yeah. program that you launched in 2015 to be able to kind of have that virtual, the blend of virtual and physical cards available 24 seven. That's been going on five or six years now, but it's still somewhat unknown and misunderstood by many collectors. <laughs> And there's a few things there that I was I was curious about. I was hoping maybe we could hit on today. And, and the first one is, if you go to UpperDeck.com, there's really no reference to the EPAC program at all off of the main website. And I was just curious on, on why that is. Well, EPAC is a sensitive subject for a lot of our uh, distribution. You know, uh, it used to be you had hobby, uh, which are all the mom and pop shops, and then you had retail as your 
your two, two cores of distribution. Now you've got, uh, you know, online stores, we have authorized group breakers, we have authorized internet retailers, there's all these new methods of distribution. And EPAC is one of those. However, EPAC is something that is very sensitive to our, our larger retailers like Walmart and Target, uh, as well as our mom and pop shops. A, a lot of them were very much afraid that, uh, that EPAC would be us going direct to consumer and stealing their consumers. And so we don't do a lot to market EPAC because we don't want to hurt their business. Uh, really what EPAC is designed for is convenience. You know, we live in an on-demand society where people don't want to always get up and go out to the store, uh, especially right now. Uh, so we've seen a huge uh, bump in activity on EPAC during the pandemic because people didn't want to leave their house. And, and how cool is it that you can sit on the couch and open up new packs and uh, trade with people around the world and actually have them sent to you or move them to Com C and sell them or have them sent out for grading. So there's there's so many cool aspects of the EPAC platform. Um, and people can get started at upperdeckepac.com. Uh, you can open up a free digital pack each day, but we really just didn't want it to be something that uh, competes or hinders the ability of our, our small business uh, partners in particular. So yeah, if we go to a show, a hobby show, you're not going to see pretty much any mentions of EPAC there by our, by our company. But if we go to a, because, and again, that's because we don't want to interfere with the business of our, our hobby partners. But if we go to, say, the All-Star Game and there's, there's no hobby partners set up there, EPAC is the perfect way for us to engage that fan and teach them about what collecting is. And, and so we will usually have QR codes or some promotion there and try to bring them into the fold through EPAC. And then, you know, as they learn more about the hobby, then they, they find out about shops and things like that too. So it's basically become a new method of distribution for us. Now, the partnership with ComC is another unique aspect of, of the EPAC program. So people, as you said, buy their cards through the EPAC website, but those physical cards are fulfilled through ComC. What has that partnership with ComC taught you? Well, it's actually what makes uh, EPAC work. It's like a triangle. Um, so you have upper deck. I'll put it at the top of the triangle because we actually make the cards. Uh, and then you have Com C who stores them, fulfills them. Uh, very important partner. And then there's a, a third company called Dynamics, who is our uh, uh, basically our way of making sure that everything's on the up and up, that it's a third party that is doing the, you know, the back end. So that Upper Deck can't influence things. You know, I, I, I can't give my buddy a loaded box, you know, things along those lines. You don't want to have any of those issues of impropriety. And by having that key third partner in Dynamics, we can eliminate that and make sure that the algorithms are all right for how things are supposed to hit and, and what have you. So um, that's really important to note Dynamics involvement in this. And uh, they're a very well-renowned company. But getting back to your question with the Com C aspect, they're they're fabulous to deal with. But what I what I realized in my conversations with Tim Getz, who's the the head of Com C in particular, is just how difficult that business is. The storage of so many items and pulling and packing, and then holy shoot, you know we're in a pandemic and Washington is hit real hard, and they're in Washington, and so they have staff out and and backlogs too. So yeah, I I, it, I think it made me realize that while ComC is a great idea, it's a lot of work. And, and Tim and his team do a fantastic job of, of doing what they do, uh, dealing with customers who can sometimes be very passionate. And, uh, and I'm, I'm proud of them. I'm proud to, that we're a partner of theirs. And, and I know that, that there's delays and, and lag times right now that are frustrating customers, but uh, ComC will get through that. They're, they have some very, very sharp staff and uh, very dedicated staff that uh, understand this business and and will be uh, will be getting it where it needs to be. Just like I'm scaling up on the customer care side, I'm I'm sure they're scaling up as well. Let's pivot a little bit to some upcoming products. And it was recently announced that Fleer Metal Universe is coming back to hockey. What can you tell us about that product? That it's going to be hard to get. <laughs> I mean. Honestly, that's one of the biggest challenges. We have all these, these products coming out 
and not all these products, but we have products coming out. And right now, Mike, I, I'm sure you'll agree. I've never, ever seen the market like this. Like I'm talking, this is bigger than the eighties heyday. This is like beanie babies big. Like it's, it's crazy. All the interest that we've seen is people are stuck at home and looking for a hobby. They don't have, they're not spending money on trips. They're not spending money on going out to dinner. And people have really, really, really re-engaged. And it's hit, I think it's hit the basketball market probably the hardest where, where, you know, a box that was a hundred dollars is now 350. And imagine trying, it, it's hard enough to open up a hundred dollar box and get the value out of it right then, let alone the, the, the lack of supply and the huge demand, it's created a, a real situation. So I think that's one of the biggest problems in our industry right now is that there are so many new consumers in here and, and we don't have enough product for them. Uh, if you look on EPAC in particular, the news section, you'll see that almost daily there's a new product selling out. There is just a tremendous amount of activity and, and, and finding, you know, I go back to like a, a product like 2001 Upper Deck Golf. You know, that was a product that I'd find at a show for $5 a box. You know, Upper Deck made just a, a bit too much of it, unfortunately. And the, the market responds in ways when they don't think an item is as collectible. But now with all the new users in the market, the prices on those boxes have gone way up. And with new Upper Deck Golf products coming out, I, I expect that to continue. So we're in an unprecedented time, unprecedented time in our industry where anything that comes out is, is going for way above of cost and the, the proposition of opening it and getting the, the value that we put into it is a tough proposition. But sorry, that was a long round away about uh, Fleer Metal show, or Skybox uh, metal, uh, metal Hockey. Um, and I'm excited about it because it's, it's bringing back a lot of old inserts that we haven't seen in a long time. And especially inserts that, you know, you don't necessarily see or think of in hockey. But what I think, one of the reasons why I think that particular release is getting a lot of attention is because of, and I wanted to talk about that before, I think a lot of the basketball collectors are, are being priced out and are a bit, a bit uh, you know, looking for what else is out there. And having a, a release like uh, Skybox Metal Universe, it's like, oh, this is, this is, these are inserts I know. These are inserts I grew up with. These are inserts I loved. So I think we're seeing that that movement uh, where some of the, the basketball uh, folks are definitely getting their pre-orders in for uh, Metal Universe because it's it's something they're familiar with, something they know, and something that I think they're romanticized and, and will enjoy breaking. So uh, I think hockey fans are going to enjoy it. I know people coming over for basketball are going to enjoy it. Uh, but really, it's uh, kind of a love letter to some of the old uh, Skybox and Fleer uh, designs. So uh, I'm excited to see it come back. Yeah, those historic Fleer and Skybox lines from other sports are really starting to find some some new life over the last couple of years, and it, it they really haven't been that heavily utilized by you in the in the hockey line, other than a, a handful of Marvel releases that are using them. You know, over the last couple of years, we put out several releases right after you know we we purchased the rights to make Fleer trading cards, and they didn't do well. Um, because I think the collector base at that time, they were burned by redemptions that were never fulfilled. They were burned by quality issues that never got a response to. And it was just a, a bad experience. And collectors have very long memories. So I, I think that that took its toll. But now we have this influx of interest in the category. And a lot of people who collected during the 80s and, and romanticized the Flair name, uh, 80s and early 90s, and... Um, it's uh, they're they're wanting to see more of it, and uh, and we'll deliver. Well, it's just that uh, you know you can't make a, a trading card set in in two months. It's uh, it's a long process, about a year process at least, uh, to get something out the door. So uh, we'll keep uh, banging on that, and I think people will see more with Flair as as we reestablish it as a a product fans can trust. Yeah, I think that's something that that is is good to hear. Like you said, things ebb and flow over time, but it definitely seems over the last year or two that whole nostalgia for Fleer Skybox branded products is only continuing to grow. So hopefully we'll get a chance to, to like you said, see a little bit more of that in the years to come. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I'm working on a promo set right now. 
I mean, I romanticize, hold on, I'm trying to find it. I romanticize this set a lot from when I collected as a kid. Fleer? Yeah. And so I want to do a, a, a promo set using that, uh, that design. We'll probably do something different on the back because, you know, the cards were much thinner stock then. But um, this is something that I was like, you know what? I think folks would really dig seeing this design come back. So uh, at least it's a promo set. So um, that's one of the fun things that I think we can do is, you know, you could have these, these large sets, these revenue sets, but at an event like the national or the expos or, or some of the other uh, things that we do, we can create some promotional uh, sets that are, that are fun and engaging and that we can get out a little bit quicker based on uh, market interest. So um, that's one I think that people will see relatively soon from us. So we talked about, some potential rebirth of some of the Fleer Skybox lines. You hit on the fact that golf is going to be making a return this spring and summer. Anything else that you might be able to tease us with on, on what we might be, uh, should keep an eye out for in the coming months? Uh, we do have a couple new uh, uh, licenses. We will be announcing over the course of this next year, uh, some new uh, athletes as well. Um, but unfortunately, I have to keep my lips sealed until uh, until we're ready to go out with that. But uh, we're not done. I mean, Upper Deck is uh, uh, is a company that is uh, dedicated to being part of the industry for a long, long time. We're privately held. And uh, uh, I kind of think of it as a bit of a family business. So um, I'm excited to see what uh, what we do, not only this year, but uh, but in the years to come. Anything else that you want to make sure that the listeners are aware of when it comes to Upper Deck and what you've got going on? Yeah, I would say uh, just engage with us. I, I, I think we're one of the companies that is more reactive in the market um, because we, we really do value our customers so, uh, and collectors. And we want to hear those stories about you know, what you've finished and what you've completed and what you're working on. So definitely hit us up. Uh, you can go to upperdeck.com slash connect and see all the different places you can find us on social media and uh, definitely recommend uh, engaging. And, and uh, once we get through this pandemic, I I look forward so much to getting back to the shows and and seeing uh, all our collectors and dealers and, uh, and have some fun. I think the shows are going to be pretty crazy uh, once, once they, uh, once they get back, because there's just, there's just so many people that are so fired up about the, the hobby these days. So it'll be a lot of fun. And where can people follow you? Uh, if they want to follow me, I'm uh, at Pete and Cavillia on Twitter or Chris Carlin on, on Facebook. So awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us. And uh, I really appreciate the conversation. Absolutely, Mike. Thanks so much. Thanks again to Chris for coming on. I really enjoyed talking to him about what is going on at Upper Deck. And I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit more about that. I am a little bit intrigued about these other licenses that are on the horizon and other athletes they're looking to sign. I know AEW Wrestling is one of those licenses that's been rumored, and I think we've got some pictures that have been released, so Upper Deck getting a wrestling license would be cool. And rumor has it that uh, the other one that we might be hearing about is Star Wars. Uh, There's some people saying Topps has lost a Star Wars license and that Upper Deck might be a candidate to pick it up since they already have Disney and Marvel in their umbrella. So Chris didn't hint on that. He didn't give us that away, but... Through some of the other internet forums and things, those are a couple things that I have been hearing. And so it'll be interesting to see if that comes through later this year as Chris talked about uh, these new product lines and new releases that might be coming. Let me know what you think about the conversation. Reach out to me at waxpackhero at gmail.com and uh, let me know what you think. Also, leave a rating and review on your podcast app of choice. I would love to hear what you think, and it also helps other people find the show. So thanks again for tuning in, and I'll catch you next time.